Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our weekly post-Cabinet press briefing. It's good to see you all. Um, today we have a very interesting group, and I'm sure we'll be having a very interesting presentation. Our special guest is Minister of State in the Ministry of Entertainment, Tourism, Tourism and Entertainment, the Honorable Damian Crawford. To his left, we have Mr. Coy Roach from the Jamaica Bauxite Management Limited. Mining, Mining, Mining Limited. Limited. Sorry. And um, to his left, we have Mr. Gillian Wilkinson from the Ministry of Tourism. And of course, my immediate left, Minister Sandra Fortner, who will begin the deliberations. Thank you, Lovelet. And Lovelet is deputizing for Lincoln, who is on a week's break. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And we want to thank our viewers on PBCJ and those on the World Wide Web. Cabinet has approved an amendment to the Customs Act to provide the Commission of Customs with additional power to forego the security requirements on the temporary importation of goods. Drafting instructions have also been issued to the Chief Parliamentary Council. This will be applicable in circumstances where the office is satisfied that the goods so imported will be re-exported from the island within the time specified. The new regime which will come into effect next month will fast track the movement of goods through the ports by investors, delegates and organizers of meetings, events and conventions as well as the promoters of the film industry and international sporting events. It will also significantly reduce the costs for persons who are investing and participating in major promotions and productions, thus allowing Jamaica to attract more of these events. And I'm sure that Minister Crawford is happy with this development. Cabinet has given approval for Jamaica to ratify the Arms Trade Treaty, which was signed last June at the United Nations in New York. Approval was also given for the following. New legislation to enable the establishment of a body as the designated competent national authority to monitor and keep comprehensive records, establish and maintain the control system and the control list where relevant. The amendment of the Firearms Act and the Gunpowder and Explosives Act as well as any other existing legislation to include the relevant provisions necessary for the implementation of the treaty and the issuing of drafting instructions to the Chief Parliamentary Council. It must be noted that ratification of the Arms Trade Treaty would assist Jamaica in addressing the challenges related to the inflow of small arms into the country. The intention of the Arms Trade Treaty is to regulate international trade in conventional weapons so as to prevent their diversion from the legal market to the illicit trade. The treaty establishes common international standards governing the transfer of conventional weapons, including small arms and light weapons. Cabinet has instructed that steps be taken to keep the cost of annual reports by government entities at a minimum. This follows the tabling of recommendations from a cabinet subcommittee on annual reports. The recommendations include the use of in-house resources for the production of these annual reports, the utilization of the Jamaica Information Cent Service, no professional photo shoots, and cabinet will continue to receive hard copies of the annual reports to facilitate deliberations. Cabinet emphasized the need for transparency and good governance as well as the efficient use of resources in the production and presentation of annual reports. Cabinet has given approval for the Minister of National Security to participate in the fourth biennial Jamaica Diaspora UK National Conference in Birmingham and for bilateral meetings in London with government ministers and security officials. The Jamaica Diaspora UK has helped to create awareness and encourage the participation of the Jamaican community in New York. The Minister will update the conference on crime fighting measures and social intervention programs such as Operation Resilience, Unite for Change, 
capacity building for the major organized crime and anti-corruption task force MOCA, the progress of INDICOM and the citizen security and justice program. The UK government has provided significant support to the crime management efforts of the government of Jamaica. For example, the UK government has made a commitment of 8.8 .8 million pounds to the third phase of the citizen security and justice program has provided financial assistance and personnel to start up and successfully operate the anti-corruption branch of the JCF. Six million pounds was provided for enhancing JCF accountability program and recently 322,000 pounds was provided to help the country monitor high-risk deportees. The minister will be accompanied by permanent secretary in the ministry and his advisor Nikisha Burrell. The trip will cost two million dollars. Cabinet has approved the appointment of the board of the Petroleum Corporation of Jamaica Petrojam. The life of the board is for a period of two years from June 2014 to June 2016. The chairman is businessman Mr. Chris Cargill and you can get the names of the other directors uh, afterwards. Cabinet has also approved the appointment of the Board of Directors for the Jamaica Bauxite Mining Limited, JBM. The board will also serve for two years from June 2, 2014 to June 1, 2016. And the chairman of that board is attorney at law, Mr. Linton Walters. And you may recall that yesterday, the Minister of Science, Technology, Energy and Mining, the Honorable Philip Paulwell, Paulwell announced that an agreement has been finalized resulting in the sale of Jamaica Bauxite Mining Limited's 7% interest in West Indies Alumina Company, Windalco, to the United Company, Rusal, Alumina Jamaica Limited, UC Rusal. The purchase price is for $11 million, and that's U.S. dollars. And the purchase price shall be credited against the debt that is owed, and the remaining, the remaining amount of $10 million 152,868 US dollars which comprise the debt after the application of the purchase price shall be settled by the JBM and we have Mr. Coy Roach who is the managing director of the JBM with us this morning and we also am happy to say we also have with us fresh from his presentation in Parliament yesterday and a lovely presentation, very lively and enjoyable presentation yesterday. We have the Minister of State and the Ministry of Tourism and Entertainment, the Honorable Damien Crawford. And I will ask him to say a few words and then we'll open the floor for questions. Minister. Thank you very much, Minister Faulkner. Uh, good morning, everyone. The, the aim of the presentation yesterday was firstly to reposition entertainment in the minds of many Jamaicans as not being a recreation only but a business. That there's a business aspect of recreation. Um, not far removed is tourism, for example, which is very well celebrated as a business. And so therefore what we wanted to do was to establish that not only is entertainment a viable business, but it's a business with low barriers to entry that can be used in our fight against poverty and the removal of poverty. It's for that reason why I made a statement that welfare is not the responsibility of the government in perpetuity, but instead the responsibility of the government is to create an environment for the escape of poverty and um, low barrier investment, um, low investment barriers is a, is a necessity for that, especially as we are replacing labor with technology and entertainment has proven to be one of those. We spoke about some aspects within entertainment, in particular um, my management culture, uh, craft, I'm sorry, and what we were doing with craft. Um, we're in particularly proud of what we're doing with the one craft per community and also the craft authority. We spoke to coming to tourism and the fact that we have finally tabled the coming to tourism draft and we're now um, doing um, island-wide consultations. We spoke to, of course, the registry and the rating spoke to noise abatement and for the first time identifying areas that could be a zone including downtown Kingston where we would retrofit the car parks and as well as um, the Palisades which Nepal already has zoned for recreation, heritage and entertainment activity but more importantly zoned against housing which means that um, we could definitely use that as one. Uh, we also spoke to what we have achieved um, based on some of the promises we made last year, such as the retrofitting of school, um, what they call them, theaters or 
auditoriums to facilitate drama. If you look at most of the, the flyers that you see that um, the Shibata plays, etc., they go around to different areas using the school facilities. And so we decided that we would outfit it with lighting and proper sound so that uh, more of these drama activities can be facilitated. However, this will also have the dual benefit of having, for the first time, Jamaican students be capable of taking CXE um, stagecraft uh, as, as, as a CXE subject. No, no, not before has this been done. We also finally have a Poet Laureate, the first in 60 years, but the first official government appointed Poet Laureate. And we reported on what was Arts in the Park and the returns that we have received, in particular from the last Arts in the Park, where four persons who were highlighted um, actually have been booked to perform at, at two festivals in, 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 in England. And so the aim of the Arts in the Park was to expose our, our, our talent to intermediaries and hope that the intermediaries would then expose them to the major markets. It's not just a shell long event as was suggested when we actually suggested, um, reported that we would try. So in general, um, we, we, we feel proud of our team, what we have achieved. We highlighted many of the things that we have done for the first time in, in, in Jamaica's history. And I think that entertainment has finally been receiving um, sufficient attention as a true industry from government and, and interest. So that was what the, the presentation, in the main, as it relates to my portfolio, um, was, was about. Thank you, Minister. We open the floor to questions. We go with Janella first at the back. Janella, we're not going to take questions from you if you don't come up here. If you sit around there, we'd read you know. Okay, that's the only reason why <laughs> I'm going to excuse you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Jamaica. Uh, this one is for Minister Crawford. How far are you in your discussions with uh, UDC regarding the Palisados for the ed um, entertainment zone? Well, the UDC have already identified seven spots that is are possible sources of venues. Having identified those spots, we will then um, continue our conversations with NEPA to ensure that the methodologies that are put in place are satisfactory from an environmental preservation aspect. For example, one conversation we are having now is that you might actually not be capable of having permanent sewage, but instead to remain with removal of sewage each day based on the fact of the, the environmental protection realities that exist. But we have already identified the sites that are possible and now we're going to be making a call for public-private partnership. We don't intend to have a zone and then everybody build what they feel, how they feel. So we have identified them, we know what the sizes and the capacity are and um, we're moving forward. Further along however is what we have identified downtown with the, with, the, with the parking lots and the Ministry of Tourism through the TF will be seeking to retrofit these parking lots simply with screwing posts. So in the afternoons, let's say at by nine, you screw in the posts, you put a fence around and then after the event, four or five o'clock, you scroll the post and it's a parking lot once again. And that is in a commercial area, unlikely to, to be a disturbance. And so we're doing sound testing to ensure. Because nobody can, can predict how sound travels um, based on where it's bouncing, whatever. And so now we're doing sound tests in this area to say this, this particular parking lot qualifies, but this one does not qualify. Also, just to be clear, the sound tests, they have started? In downtown, the one downtown. in downtown, we are now doing, doing sound testing. And your vision for Palisados? The vision for Palisados is to have seven particular venues. Um, I hope that over time it will come to reflect what Miami Beach is, so that not only would you have venues for activities, but you'll also be able to have centralized parking, you'll also be able to have food activities. I hear some concern that, oh, it's one way in, one way out, and it might disturb the, the airport. However, there is not the same time realities in when events start and when um, we have flights going out. So I don't expect to have many flights going out at 12.30 in the night. Um, so, so therefore, we don't think that that would be an issue. And Jamaica is not sufficiently wealthy nor sufficiently large to have single-use places or single-use roads. Uh, sir, in, in, in your discussions, um, did you get the feedback from promoters, for example, as to uh, possible spots? Uh, that are likely to be entertainment zones? Yes, um, we, we had many discussions with promoters, with artists, but also with the public because it's two sides to the whole aspect of night noise nuisance. There are those who want to have the events, but there are those who don't want to be disturbed. And so the number one consideration with a zone is that there can be no future housing development because people make that investment and tomorrow you have an apartment and then it is no longer capable to be a D zone. Um, remember we said that Jamaica is, has so many activities that you have multiple types of zones. So we have a B zone which is a residential area. You cannot 
have a D zone that eventually be transformed into a B zone because an apartment is there. And so why the Palisades is good is because it's already zoned against housing, which means that in perpetuity we expect that it will be capable of being an uh, entertainment zone. Um, remember when we used to have a lot of activities out in, in the St. Catherine area, until now there's a big apartment just out there and now it is it's a complaint. So the number one consideration is that it is zoned against housing, and that is what is very good. Now downtown also qualifies because it is highly commercial, and we don't see any time soon that we'll be transforming from commercial to residential. So it therefore also satisfies the need of separating houses, um, residence, and, 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 and entertainment activity. Final question has to do with the entertainment registry. Um, what has been the feedback so far? How many persons have registered? We have gotten good feedback. Um, we have not had a, a great extent of registration. We're now embarking on our marketing campaign. We didn't want to preempt the speech too much. And so we, we're now going to be going on our marketing campaign. You'll, um, the GIS is actually designing a full campaign for us and um, for the rest of this month and next month. And that is why the deadline is the 31st of July. Um, there's also some concern about if it can be implemented. Since September, we, September 2013, we have been in, 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 in conversation with the Ministry of Local Government and um, it is not a law, it's actually a, a, a regulation for which they'll be carrying a paper to Parliament to change the regulation to facilitate to facilitate that. So therefore um, we, we, we feel that we have sufficient time to fully educate um, the persons and the only people who are required are promoters. Um, others can volunteer to participate. Any other question? Ingrid from the Observer. We'll come to you afterwards, um, Edmund. Go ahead, Ingrid. Thanks, Minister. Good morning to you. The issue, Minister Crawford, of can you just clarify for Pal Palisados, is it going to be a private-public partnership in terms of the um, erecting buildings or venues there? Well, I think they call it softscaping. Uh, uh, for example, we're looking at containers as walls, more so than to build permanent walls. We're also looking at places that are already in existence, like gunboat, which already have that, that, that thing around. So therefore, we're not seeking to now transform and build all kind of um, big buildings and big, big, big big units, what we're seeking to do is to have kind of soft um, development out on that side. Again, it will be more educated by NEPA's views and educated by the UDC who are better capable in architecture than I. However, what is my number one aspect from a policy side is to say that there needs to be some possibility of separation of noise as a nuisance in residential areas and noise as entertainment for residents. And what's so therefore that's what we're doing. What's a realistic timeline that you're looking at? Uh, well, a realistic timeline is dependent on how many people want to invest. I would say to someone that owns, let's say, mass camp, that you'll be quite um, in a competitive disadvantage if you're in a place outside of a 24-hour zone. And so persons who are interested in investing in entertainment should be putting their funds together so that as soon as we announce a call for proposals. And, and you'll realize that most things coming out of the Ministry of Entertainment are public calls. We don't do one-off private conversation. Um, we do public calls and persons who are interested in the public call, but we want to have a consist consistent design. And so that's why we're waiting on, on, on UDC and ourselves to work out how we think it should look, how it should fit into the heritage of the area. Um, should, it, should, it, should it be should the architecture resemble the, the whole pirate thing, whatever, so that it can also serve to the heritage um, realities that Nepal has also zoned that era for. So while we want investment from, from, from private sector, I don't think we're leaving the total design to the private sector. And as for the initiative for downtown, um, do you have any concerns about people might be unwilling to go there given the crime factors and its association with downtown? And yeah. how do you plan Well, to for those who that? are afraid of downtown, they may gravitate to Palisades. For those who can't afford Palisades, they may gravitate to downtown. Um, that's, that's the reality. If we have seven venues in Palisades, why, why downtown evolved in my mind? If we have seven venues in the Palisades, then demand and supply will drive the prices up. Currently, you're renting a, a venue between $150,000 to $500,000. So can you imagine if there you are a 24-hour venue? So to that extent, we wanted to ensure that a man who knows keeping a street dance could also afford some type of venue. And that is why especially government parking lots would be available at a much cheaper price. We're also going to be talking to, talking to, um, to, to JUTC to provide shuttle because a lot of people speak to zones, but zones are by definition away from homes. Now if you don't have sufficient transportation, how are you going to have zones? And so because we only consider those who own vehicles, we don't really consider the people who need public transportation. But public transportation don't work after 10 p.m. So we're saying when you book a zone downtown, you might be capable to have a shuttle 
um, provided so that you can transport those who want to be at the event down to, to the zone, right? And if I may respond to your security question, I mean, Style Week, Saint International has, ha has had very successful events on the waterfront, as had the Dennis Brown Trust with regard to the Dennis Brown concert. So there are events that happen downtown that have been um, critically acclaimed, and, and so we don't necessarily see an issue with the issue of security. And I think most of the events that the KCAC has, are down they are downtown, and, and those see thousands and thousands of people. So I don't think it, it's that much of an issue. Uh, it would also be easier for the police to be protecting downtown than to be responding to every call for a nice nuisance. So therefore, they, they should be quite happy to assist. Edmond? Minister Crawford, just shifting focus a little before I come back to your portfolio responsibility. You made a, a brilliant um, suggestion in Parliament yesterday regarding the Rural uh, Maintenance Fund. In fact, my grandparents are from rural, East Rural St. Andrew. I remember no, no politics in here in this room. <laughs> no, I, 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 I can't can't no, no <laughs> it's a very important it's a, very, it's a parliamentary issue actually. Yeah. I'm okay. coming to it. Just want to be clear, Edmund. I'm coming to it. But um, clearly, we've been having some serious challenges in terms of rural communities and the road infrastructure. I'm wondering if you're willing to go a step further in taking a motion to Parliament and have this matter debated because I am, in my mind, I believe that the parliamentarians, particularly from rural areas, I'm, I'm, I'm sure when you were making your presentation yesterday, there was a lot of support, in ter particularly from the rural parliamentarians, in terms of you know, getting this fund established. So I'm wondering if you're willing to go all the way in terms of taking a motion to parliament and getting this matter debated. Well, I, I'm willing to do what is necessary. The, 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 the Prime Minister is very, very interested in rural development. In her own presentation, she spoke to that. And I was making a point that this is one aspect that must be considered for rural development because the persons, rural, rural communities now seem to be positioned as leave if you can and stay if you must. And one of those realities is because of the, li the little infrastructure that exists. And so, therefore, if you want to keep those persons that will be catalysts for change and development within these communities, then greater infrastructure needs to be done. However, about the constraints that we face has caused for a matrix which says most people served and most rural communities will not be in that case, um, not fit there because of the, 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 the fact that people are migrating out. That is a culture of urban migration. So sometimes you don't ha I'll do what is necessary if I have to carry to parliament um, in that way. But I think that the minister um, understood the point that I was making and I don't think that he's in disagreement. So it might not be necessary to, to do that. But I, I think that it is necessary to be done. The, um, Edmond, if I may, the Prime Minister has a Rural Development Task Force and one of the areas that they will be looking at are those areas to ensure that we are able to spread development in rural communities as well and to make sure that people will want to remain in rural communities. So I think you'll be hearing more right. on not that. Not to belabor the point though, but some of these areas, I'm talking about 30 years or more, Yes. And no work whatsoever. Has I, I been believe done that, that was experience. one of the considerations that the Prime Minister had because so many of these rural communities are neglected and she felt that there needed to have been some focus on rural communities and their development. In terms of the craft sector, Minister, you spoke about the council, which I suppose will morph into an authority over yes. a period of time. Give, give me a timeline on when this will take place. Well, we were hoping to, to announce a chairman yesterday. <laughs> so, unfortunately, we have not finalized our negotiations for a chairman. So as soon as we find a chairman, that authority would be in place. We have already had um, lots of communication with the craft vendors, with the craft makers, and it's very important that we make it clear that it's not only for vendors, they're also makers. And that is why we are seeking to have a system that replaces the, the, lab, the mass importation of Chinese and other um, external craft. And one of the problems that we have had in the history of craft organization is that the vendors were managed by one unit and the, and the producers were managed by another unit and seldom did they meet. And so what we're doing is to put the all practitioners on the one timetable and give them a greater say in, in what should be done. So which market should be fixed shouldn't be a discussion that is held only in the Ministry of Tourism by the two ministers and, and, and the political representatives, but that craft vendors should be capable of sitting. And I, and I gave a, a, an example yesterday about my, my disagreement with having elephants being sold. And it was highlighted to me that that's one of the best sellers because 
worldwide is accepted that the elephant with the tusk up is 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 um is good luck is a sign of good luck so things that we believe that are limited exposure through knowledge makes us better capable to be managers of their industry um, are, are not so. So I think the authority is a, is a, is a great step, but it will also be to manage as well um, certain things. For example, it is the authority that will enforce some of the copyright realities that we are now implementing in craft. One of the reasons nobody designed craft is that after the first design, somebody replicated and you make no money from it. Now we have 137, um, 118 already this year having been registered on the, on the JIPO. Um, and so a person within the market would have had to have a certificate of purchase that he has a, 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 a to, to sell that person's craft. Now, we can go in that. That authority will be there to go in and make um, random checks, etc., to ensure. So a person coming from Edna Manley now is looking for a teaching job more than to continue in craft because his design has no true value as is because it will be replicated once it's been sold. And so those are the things that we feel that the authority will be very, very capable to do. Uh, Minister Falk, no. yes. I think Cabinet made a decision to um, speak to the whole issue of annual reports and the cost, how much it is costing the country mm -hmm. to produce these reports. Um, I think it's a, a very good decision, but I want to find out how will the government monitor this because Having said that, I mean, it's one well, thing, but by, by an order of the cabinet, all government entities will be told about the new guidelines. We don't, what we need is the information. We don't need full gloss and full photo shoots that those things cost a lot of money. And so what we, we're focused on is more on the information instead of the gloss and the pretty productions. So the message, the cabinet secretary has been tasked with getting the message out to the different government entities. There, there is not a ceiling yet. The cabinet subcommittee met uh, a week and uh, two weeks ago, and what we are getting as well, we have asked from the government entities or we have instructed that they send in what it is costing now because we, the concern came at the cabinet level because we saw different looks for annual reports. Some were very simple, just simple spiral binds. Others were productions that, that you would have seen in a major marketing campaign. And the concerns were raised that this was not necessary for just information that is needed. Yes, it, it is part of what we need in terms of the governance framework and the accountability. So we didn't need to have all the gloss and the professional photo shoots and the professional pagination and all of that. What we need is the information, information that is accurate and transparency. We didn't need to spend a ton of money for that and the cabinet is, is aware of that and we want to change that. Hope done. Yeah, Minister, thank you. Um, Minister, we saw, well, you already commended um, um, Honorable Damon Crawford on his presentation. I have two questions primarily. Um, well, one for Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford, you mentioned about um, beneficiaries receiving benefits from their dead parents or their benefit benefactor. Will, will, will benefit, yes. Yeah, will benefit from the NHT. Um, you, did you consider about what happened to a debt left owing by the benefactor on the beneficiaries from the NHT? What about that? Well, th those are two different things. Uh, the, the first is saying that um, many persons, especially the poor, incapable of affording the, the other payments to, to achieve an NHT house, many times would have died without a, 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 an ability to leave anything for their child. And I don't believe that that is a reasonable reality for a person formerly employed 30, 40 years. And so that extends what I call a tale of poverty because um, even if a child goes to the university um, from a poor parent, by the time he pays all his, his student loan and then find a, a wife or a husband and, and put the local points together, um, you're 45 and cause for the, the, the payment then to be of, of uh, uh, much higher and if you calculate the rent that you'd have paid over time you possibly could have bought two houses and so I'm saying that um, when, a, when, a, when a parent worked formally for X years and, and is on their deathbed they should be able to leave that benefit to the child it's different if I actually took a house and, and owe the NHT um, that is for the NHT and the legal and, and, and debt collection department to consider that's not a policy position 
and that I, I believe they have they mechanisms should. and they should have mechanisms such as insurance etc yes. and the, and the loan but that's not the same as what yeah. I was speaking to I um, remember that the, the home would be collateral right, for that so those things would take yeah. care of uh, Damien there has been much talk at this press conference about entertainment zones which is a good idea what about the Caymanas area which is now under development and not doesn't have any houses yet and there's ample land there and there is ample parking yeah. near to a highway except um, about that, that, that those are the things I would say we want to try it in, in an area and the first year that we saw zone against housing was, was the Palisades what we have to ensure as I said is that you don't ask people especially private persons to invest in a D zone that eventually becomes a B zone or an A zone because a hospital is put next to it next week and so therefore it takes a longer period to identify areas that are then zoned against housing especially because how we run things is that a house can go anywhere um, so what was agriculture land eventually become an apartment what was water commission land is an apartment so therefore we have to ensure that we don't ask for persons to invest nor sell a false hope that entertainment can go there till next year entertainment to find somewhere else so we're looking at the plans we're having discussions with the ministry of investment what are going to be the, the plans for the development of that side and how we can fit a zone inside it okay the jamaica bauxite company limited has sold Seven percent. Jamaica of Bauxite Mining, Mining Limited. Limited has sold seven percent to UC Rasal. Okay, good move, UC Rasal. How you pronounce it? However, um, I have two concerns. One, we keep selling out valuable assets, productive assets from this country to pay debt. Why I wasn't able to sell the entire thing for the twenty-one million? And what does it mean for Jamaica? Do I'm um, getting rid of this seven percent of um, our bauxite interest. Well, I, at seven percent for I've been working with Jamaica bauxite mining for about eight years now, and in that period, that seven percent has never realized net uh, positive cash flow because the cost of production of all of the Yorton plant, for example, is far exceed the, the no world price of aluminum. So we have been at a loss, and that's why you had that cumulative amount of um, it would have been significantly higher if we hadn't put things in place some strategy we used earlier it would have been about 40 odd million we have owed and get 11 million for it we, we did valuation and that's that's the value of the asset at this time finally um, mm -hmm. on the question of we saw on tv the idea a very disturbing image of two hard back men two tough back men holding down a woman um in ochoria for some interaction, you know, there has to be a better policy. I mean, I, I, I do not support tourist harassment. That's but not what, as, as, as Minister of Tourism, what do you plan to do about that? Because it does not look good be beam across the world of two hardback men holding down one woman. Well, we, we, we would not want hard nor softback um, <laughs> people. <laughs> Holding, holding down women. That is not the policy of, of the ministry. I mean, we are anti-harassment in, in, in its entirety, um, but it is not our policy to then use brute force to, to solve it. What we are working on right now, one is training, because uh, we must accept that our culture of selling is different from the, the visitor's culture of buying. And cultural differentiation is an automatic part of tourism. Sometimes it is a, a lure, it's an attraction, and sometimes a negative. So when we give a first price, that is just the first price. You're supposed to come with a second price. When an American asks a price, it's the price. So a lot of times when they're walking away, we're holding them to consider the second price. So we're doing some training in that. We're also putting in for some, 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 some better training for our, our resort core um, to, to improve upon their, their thing. And we're also seeking to carry persons from outside because, we, again, I, I find Jamaicans don't like troop sometimes, but uh, they're, they're a person, many harassers are criminals in totality not just harassers that's not the only crime there's some harassers selling drugs and there's some harassers that are dance etc so you ask somebody that only have a hat and a whistle to go and complain on a man who is a dan it's incapable to do that his house might be in trouble um the next time or, or he might have to move and all those things so we're looking at those realities that it's not just to have persons there but we might have to have a rotation system where nobody knows who john is um, our, our John is an is a undercover police and so we're looking at all the possibilities but I believe that cultural differentiation must be considered and that is what we're doing so it's not a policy to have persons be subject to brute force 
um, in their attempt to earn. And that's why the presentation spoke to diversification of the beneficiaries. Can we have a hair braiding street? Which means that anybody that wants their hair to be braided would head down that street. Uh, instead of just saying that no hair braiding um, at all. Um, so there are other races who are not real criminals but simply seekers of opportunity. And we want to provide formal venues and avenues for that opportunity to be met. Oh, definitely, we condemn that type of behavior for sure. Thank you very much. How do you respond to suggestions that the government continues uh, to ignore uh, established channels um, because it continues to ignore uh, the OCG? And I'm speaking about in context of the establishment of ESET. Uh, I'm asking in context also of the fact that the opposition suggested that at a press conference this week. The government does not, the government has the right, based on our own legal advice, to disagree with opinions from the OCG. And I think in this case, the legal advice that was received by the cabinet was not in accordance with, the, with what the OCG had proffered. No, the government did not sidetrack the advice of the OUR. In, in what instance? No, I'm talk we're talking about the establishment of, of ESET, right? No, the government did not sidetrack the advice of the OUR in terms of ESET. The cabinet has the right to set up bodies to represent the cabinet or to represent a ministry. Okay, now the opposition, they have maintained that they do not support ESET. What is the cabinet has the right to do what is in the interest of the Jamaican people mm -hmm. and the cabinet believes at this time one of the most important things that we need to accomplish to is to ensure that we have cheaper rates for energy for the people of Jamaica for too long we have had situations where residents business people are burdened by the cost of energy and that is what we are focused on. So, Minister, the process continues. The process will continue with ESET and within the law. Uh, Minister, um, I, I just want to follow my colleague, um, General. The issue is, Minister, mm -hmm. this is not a question of cheap energy because we all accept that. Mm -hmm. so the what is your energy. issue, Hope The on? issue, Minister, is a question of a state body being set up to monitor, for example, it took IDB, IDB said that we're not that part of this because it has not been... Are you aware that the OUR has disagreed with the report from the OCG? And I'm not here to, I don't want to go too much into that discussion, but the OUR has disagreed with the process that was used. We have had legal advice and we are going with that legal advice. I'm not saying anything well, further on the matter. What are you going with? Because I don't understand. I just said what we're going with. We have received legal advice. The OUR also disagreed with the process that was used by the OCG to conclude that the process was wrong. If the matter is flawed and therefore you have decided to set up this, you, that's, what your, doing, Minister, that's your, your opinion. opinion. That's your opinion, Hopeton, and calm down. Ingrid, next question. Back to Minister Crawford, the issue of Jamrock Summer. Um, how will that be financed? Is that a budget from the government? Is that private sector intervention as well? How is that? Well, Jamrock Summer in the main is a coordination of most of the activities that we already have and added other aspects of benefits so as to give a greater perception of value. So when you have, for example, Sumfest, and Sumfest is of, of real value to many persons based on the price of Sumfest. But a person to fly into Jamaica for Sumfest has other costs that he must consider, um, the plane and the, the rooms, etc. And so we're saying it might be there for a deterrent for persons to come only for Sumfest. Can we build out around Sumfest a week of activities that then presents to a person a greater perception of value, therefore giving up greater likelihood that he'll spend the money to come to Jamaica? And so, for example, many times I'm at Sumfest and I can't find breakfast.
could we have a, a, a food festival, a breakfast festival? Because Jamaica breakfast is, is very different from other breakfast. I mean, Jamaica is the only people that have a high gas bill for breakfast. Because you cook dumpling, yam, um, kalalu, aki, okay, so uh, all these things. And so therefore, could, could for everything like that, um, could we have the, 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 the people who have attractions also facilitate? So if I spend to come down, there's a whole thing. So what we're looking at is 90 days, 90 ways. That's what the, the tagline is. Jamrock Summer, 90 days, 90 ways Just to experience. To make experience. the product more complete. To make, to make a full complete yes. product. So again, coming down for, for um, August 1st to 6th, um, which is our independence celebration. Could we meet with JFF and have a football match between Jamaica and Trinidad, for example? So a person in the diaspora says, oh, it's not only gala. I'm going to see a match or a cricket. or y You understand? So well, how we fill this out? So it is mostly as it relates to the private persons who have activities. And again, uh, on the 6th, 16th, we'll be having a public call for fill out activities around these things. So that is one aspect. The, the, the other aspect is to, is to um, have greater marketing activities and that is what our responsibility is and that's what we'll be funding in the main. The marketing overseas of some of these things through our channels. So we have this brilliant thing such as daydreams, right? How do we use our channels to tell the, 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 the college markets that daydreams exist or that SPF exists or that Flex Week exists? Um, and so we, we will have in those things. Um, the bauxite sector, the remainder of that outstanding amount, that 21 million, do we have a clear plan for paying that and does it attract an interest in um, the, bank. the interim? It's in the, it's in the bank to be transferred to them by the end of this month. So we had it, we had it, we knew it was coming, so we are prepared for it. So we'll be debt free after, afterwards, right? Yeah. Right. We take three more questions. Tanya McDonald from Love 101. Um, Minister Crawford, could you expound some more on the CSEC theater art in stagecraft? Yes. Um, but what, what happens is there are certain um, instruments that were needed. For example, if you're going to do CSEC in home economics, you'd need a, a stove um, and an oven so that a child could participate and, and, and learn and to do the necessary base things that they have to do. Um, to do the C second stagecraft you'll need lighting and sound and many schools were incapable to do their libraries in the first place worse to go and invest in, in lighting and sound. However if we're going to be claiming that we're a cultural super state then not only do we need a lot of artists but we need a lot of back office support so that when we have these events I mean if Celine Dion is coming she shouldn't feel the need to carry her own lighting people um, or, or any other show that we're going to be having. Um, we now have the, the cricket thing coming for uh, the 2020. They are their entertainment packaging themselves. Do we have the necessary sound and lighting and uh, people to, to, to facilitate? So one complaint we have always heard is that in any holiday where there are multiple events, there's a, a, a sparsity or scarcity of persons for back back office, let's call it back office um, support. And so therefore now we'll be able to train at backstage support. So we'll be able to train at, uh, at JC, we'll be able to train at um, St. Andrew, we'll be able to train at Geisel and, and, and at Manchester High. And this year we're going to choose another four and um, over the next four years we might have 16 schools that a child could then um, do that. So the next thing you may know, um, when I'm 70, I'm telling my granddaughter that this person on Broadway started by doing stagecraft because we took a decision to outfit schools. So it not only benefit the drama aspect, but it benefits the training and the back yeah. of office aspect. What about in universities that cater for mass communications? They, I know for certain classes, for certain schools, they might teach certain classes for that. So what about expanding it in the universities? That might, that might come um, over time. However, because universities are capable of charging higher fees, sometimes they're better capable to support th these, these, these purchase of instruments as versus um, high schools who, as I said, are in the main supported by government. So um, it might come in the future, especially if we see a high take up at the CXC level, then it might be necessary to carry them to the, the degree and possibly the master's level. Excellent. But as is faced with the constraints, we want to do as much schools, but also to 
expand the reach of the drama persons, the producers of drama, to as much places. So we don't want only a person who wants to see um, one of those Christian plays that, um, that, 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 that Daley Harris put on can't reach to Westmoreland because there's no venue. Um, so it might be necessary that Mannings be selected to have a venue so that it can have that reach expanding the market and expanding the possibility that a person may take time to write a playwright and, and, and put together a production. We, Mr. We're going to take one final comment, um, question from Ira, but Mr. Mr. Coy wants to make a comment on the Wilson Comato. Mr. Coy? Yeah. <coughs> no, I just want to mention, um, I we spoke to the OCG. Uh, <laughs> Is a pause? A break in transmission? Afterwards. Go ahead, Mr. Mr. No, I, I'm in, as you mentioned, the OCG, and sometime I would wish the government would intervene in some, in some instance. For example, in 2011, when we tried to sell our 7% to Rosal, our debt to Rosal then was 14 million, and the value was the same 11, so we would have to pay 3 million. Now the debt is 21 million, and the value is still 11. Right, so you, you see, you see uh, and the problem then was that we, along with Russell, did one valuation of the property. We used an international company, American Appraisal, to value. And we went to the OCG. They, they, they distinctly say the law says do two valuations, no flexibility at all. And I was written and told do a second one. It cost us 18.5 million Jamaican dollars to hire another company to do a second valuation. Right? And and then we ended up losing costing us seven million seven hundred and ten million Jamaican dollars more. Yes. You well, yeah. seven, seven million US yeah. more to pay to, to, to Rosal because the debt grew over that period. Just speak what year was after? In twenty eleven. Jillian, question. Final question. Hi morning, Jillian Pearson RFM is going to be very anticlimactic after all of that, but um, <laughs> Mr. Crawford, can you just tell me what the uh, ministry's ideas are on, uh, say, pay-per-view for people who can't necessarily travel for 90 days, 90 ways? Are there any plans to broadcast a show such as Sumfest for a fee to not the diaspora? New Zealand, Australia. Not, not, not by the ministry. Um, again, there's a role for private interest. And so Sting did it, for example, recently um, as a private entity, uh, etc. Now, uh, a private entity should understand that any sponsor, including the Ministry of Tourism, is interested in reach how many persons are going to see it within the markets that we want them to see. And so pay-per-view, etc., expands this reach and therefore makes it more likely that um, the ministry will be interested in, in, in support, um, much more than if the reach is only the 5,000 people that are in the venue but the ministry has no direct um, responsibility in our interest in providing it for for pay-per-view no thank you Jillian thank you everyone for coming we want to thank our viewers on PBCJ and those on the World Wide Web for watching and we want to wish you a great rest of the week thank you very much to you by Intelligence Inc. Intelligence Inc. Turning 